There are a few housekeeping things that I'd just like to share with you and um, just kind of remind you kind of why we do some things. One of them, uh, just simply because I, I've had a lot of feedback, good and bad, on, um, on background checks. We just, that's just our policy as a church in, in today's age. We want um, those working with our kids, our most precious assets, we want to make sure that those people are safe to be working with kids. It's nothing against anyone. It's not singled out to any single person. It is if you are working with our children, you are required to take a background check. And it's just simply for a safety purpose. And so we, I just want to encourage you. Um, some have, have, not, have said they weren't able to pay for those, those background checks. If you will talk to me, if we can have that conversation, that's not a hindrance, okay? So we, I want to encourage you to understand that we, we are doing this not to single anyone out, but we are doing it to make sure that our children and our youth are protected. I myself have to take a background check. Uh, Judge Mutton, uh, a, a judicial member of our society, he is required to take one if he works with kids. And it's just simply to, to keep people safe. And um, if we do it for everyone, then we can't get a lawsuit either saying that you singled someone out, and so that's that's the other reason we do that as well. So I just wanted to say that. I just want to encourage you that it is not a bad thing. If you go to other churches, our size or larger, anywhere or smaller in today's society, um, they, they're doing background checks. And Main Street's done it for a lot of years. Uh, we're just having to update those to, to stay current with our, with our insurance policy as well. So I just want to say that out of the way get that out of the way. If you have questions, please visit with me. Um, I hope that you always have known as, as a pastor, my door is always open, and I'm always willing to talk about anything. So uh, I, I just want you to know that you are welcomed in my office, and we can have the conversation hard or easy, and, 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 but I'm willing to do that. So I just want to encourage you, please don't just talk around to other people. Come visit with me. Let's get this figured out, okay? I just want to encourage you in that. If you would just believe, as the title of the message this morning, and, and we're finishing up, wrapping up our, our study, and, and, and trying to understand what it means for someone to believe in Jesus Christ. I have a, a testimony I want to share with you from a, a, a Muslim um, a individual, a young man, and, and uh, begin to help you understand kind of what goes on in other parts of the country. At 15, Muhammad was introduced to a jihadist preacher, and a few years after that, in 2011, the year the Syrian crisis broke out, a time when everyone witnessed the ugliness of fighting, he became re-energized with Islam extremism ideology the preacher spoke about. So like other young men who felt called by the movement, he joined al-Nusura on the front lines. In doing so, he tor tormented prisoners and committed a long list of horrors, all in the name of Nusra and their propaganda. According to Muhammad, it all made the violence seem tolerable. You know, al-Nusura used to tell us these prisoners were the enemies of God, and so I looked on these executions positively. The front lines of the Syrian war took its toll on a break, and on a break, he went to visit his family and his fiancée, who is now his wife, Rashid. Both his parents and Rashid expressed concern over his growing anger and short fuse. Instead of him staying at home like the family had suggested, he left and went back to fight alongside fellow soldiers in the movement. But unlike before, he started noticing different things, like Syrian national forces using barbaric measures to kill prisoners, just like his side. To him, he looked at this as an awakening, saying it was Muslims killing Muslims. Disillusioned with the idea of Muslims killing other Muslims, it was then I realized there was something wrong. It conflicted with the reason why he joined the Syrian al-Qaeda, saying, I went to Nusra in search of my God. One day, peering through binoculars at Syrian government soldiers executing their prisoners, he realized there was no difference between him and the enemy. The harshness that came with his realization made him say goodbye to al-Nusra for good. And just a few months after returning to his home in northern Syria, he fled with his wife to Turkey. Although he remained a passionate follower of Islam, he soon had an experience that introduced him to the power of Jesus Christ. When his wife Rashid became seriously ill, Bashir did the unthinkable and allowed a Christian cousin living in Canada 
to have his prayer group pray for her over the phone. In a few days, his wife recovered, and Bashir asked his cousin to introduce him to someone who could tell him more about Christ. After several conversations with a missionary, Bashir was close to renouncing Islam to follow Jesus. Bashir says the welcoming attitude of churches and the generous prayer of Christianity drew him to the faith. And he said reading the Bible brings him more peace than the Koran. But it was dreams that he and his wife had that sealed the deal. For she dreamed that a character from the Bible miraculously parted the sea. And Bashir dreamed that Jesus gave him some food. You see, it's stories of radical transformation such as this that completely amazes me. To think that, that our God would be in the midst of such ugliness and such, uh, such devilish of places. To think that our God would, would seep and would, would, would move inside of places such as that. But you know, our hearts aren't much far removed from that at times. The thing is, in our sins, we are all savages. We are all desperately in need of Jesus to just simply believe in Him. You and I are savage in our sins. We oftentimes like to measure which sin is greater. It's the human thing to do. And we try to put things on, on different levels and try to understand that. But in the eyes of a holy God, all sin is a stain. A stain that cannot enter into His presence. Our text this morning brings us to some amazing statements made by Jesus in the wake of his disciples, fearing what was to come next. And it brings us to understand what it means to believe in Jesus. Just like you and I, at times, they had not listened well when Jesus had told them what was going to be done. They, they, they weren't good listeners. You know the old adage, my, my, one of my kids reminded me of this, Olivia did this week, that that. You know, we're supposed to listen twice as much as we speak. You have two ears and one mouth. God meant you to listen twice as hard as you speak. That's difficult for some of us at times. But the disciples, they like to say things, but Jesus wanted them to listen. He wanted them to hear what he had to say because he was soon to experience the, the painful death of the cross. And he wanted them to understand what was to come next. And so he was trying to deal with them. We're in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. I hope you have a Bible with you to read along. It says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Good old Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Have you ever had a troubled heart before? I mean, where you're just troubled, down deep to the core of, of something that has happened or occurred in your life, when something was so difficult to handle that, that you feared you might just curl up, up in a ball and, and die. Jesus knew the difficulty that these disciples were having with, with what he was saying, and Thomas just wasn't listening. He wasn't, you know, they weren't comprehending what was going on. Jesus told them several times before his death on the cross, this is what was, had to come to pass uh, so that the Son could be glorified and, and that he would die, but, in, but he doesn't. They just don't listen. He tells them, but when it comes to the point of Jesus on the cross, they, they don't remember. He had just told Peter in, in 1336, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow after me. They just couldn't understand why they could not go further with him. They had just been told that one of the twelve would turn Jesus over to the Sanhedrin. Uh, the, the faith of these men was, 
was about to be tested, and Jesus knew that, and so he's trying to strengthen him. So he gives them some instructions. You and I, we like instructions sometimes, don't we? We don't like someone to tell us what to do, but in all honesty, we would like a five-step plan if this is how we do it. I mean, in, in all honesty, that's what people would like. They would, this is one, two, and three. This is what you do. But he gives them some instructions. You see, when you are in, uh, when we are in our most desperate of times, we need someone to speak truth and direction into it. When you are in your most fearful of times, you need someone to speak direction and truth and calmness into the situation. It's what the disciples needed, someone to tell them what to do. This is how he begins our text, Jesus speaking, believe in God, believe also in me. This phrase is an imperative, it's a command. If you believe in God, you must believe also in me. The text is saying, or Jesus is saying here, that that if you believe in God, you have seen him in me, so you must believe in me also. And if you believe in me, then you have already believed in a holy God. The Old Testament usage of this term, believe, denoted personal and relational trust. Our God is a God of personal uh, ability. He, he knows us. He longs for a relationship to interact. You see, that's what prayer is, an opportunity for us to interact with the Holy God. Believe in God, believe also in me. This trust was not just blind belief. Jesus wanted them to believe in him personally, to be relational in their belief. We're kind of looking at it as we do from a father and a son or daughter's perspective. There's a relationship that we are to have with the father. And it looks like good parenting. If you want to know how to parent your kids well, then look to the scriptures and see how God deals with his people. Begin to see that he loves them dearly and would send his son. He would give up everything that they would know him. But he also reprimands at times. It says that he, he, he does that because he loves them. Our society could use parents who were looking to the scriptures to parent their kids. We are called to believe in Jesus, to trust Him, and to love Him. It's not some absentee belief, but it is a belief that that our God loves us and wants best for His children. Isaiah says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. You and I must believe. We have heard what the gospel is, the good news of Jesus Christ. We have seen those who have been called to share the gospel include each and every one of us. We are all missionaries on a mission to share the truth of Jesus as believers. We have seen that that in doing so, that God blesses those who share his name. But in this, we see that we must believe. We've even looked at how we are to to share that gospel. And after all those steps, we look at this aspect of, of belief. Let's go a little further into our text. It says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. My Father's house is a reference to heaven. Jesus is speaking about where he will be and those who believe in him will one day be. And he references it as rooms and it's just to stay along with the whole theme of the house. Um, I'm hoping, I I don't want to live in an apartment. I never have and I never plan to and I never want to. So I don't think God's going to have me in an apartment. That's just the way you think about it. You know, you, you think about heaven and what that looks like, and we oftentimes personalize it, don't we? We make it look like what we think it should look like. Um, but it, 
It might not look like that to everyone else. And so we, you know, you, you think about those things. But it's not an aspect of just saying there's this house with lots of rooms in it and we're all living in the same house. The aspect is him staying in heaven. There is a place for all of those who belong to Jesus Christ. If heaven is the house, each and every one of us who believe and trust in him have a dwelling place there. We have somewhere to live. The Lord has prepared a place for those who believe in Him and trust their lives to Him. But if you want to enter heaven, though, you must believe in God and also in Jesus. Verse 6 begins to tell us what that belief looks like. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Possibly, short of John 3.16, one of the most quoted texts uh, of all time. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus does not say that he is one of the ways, that he is a way or a possible route that you could take whenever you ask Siri how to get there and it gives you five options and they're all wrong. He is not a possibility. He says, I am the way. Where else have we heard the the phrase, I am? Remember when he tells Moses to tell the people that he is I am? In in Exodus chapter 3, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yahweh, the most holy of God's names, is used to describe who he is. I am. I am is the way. I am is the way. It does not say that he once was or that he might be in the future, but instead it is present tense. He is right now. I am is the way. I've got three biblical examples that I want to show you. Uh, They show really well how mankind tries on their own ability to reach God. To try and do it without Jesus. Jesus. The first example I want to share with you is the temple curtain. It was meant to bar access to God's presence. Only the high priest could enter. He could go in with a rope tied around his waist in case the presence of God was too overwhelming and he fainted or that he went in as a sinful man and had not cleansed himself before and God smote him and knocked him dead. We see in the New Testament that Jesus was the great high priest. His offering was sufficient. We also see at the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary that the the temple temple, uh, curtain is torn from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. It it wasn't cut from the bottom. Instead, it had had completely ripped in the middle. And the, the Holy of Holies was now open, signifying that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you and I now have the opportunity to enter into the presence of a holy God. Not on our own accord, but covered in the blood of Jesus. That sacrifice was enough. Number two, we see in the Old Testament the rejection of human inventions as a means to approach God. In Leviticus, that is an interesting book. If you want to read the book and have a whole lot of fun, read Leviticus. Now Dadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. The Tower of Babel was another example. Today we attempt to reach God by idol worshiping, unholy meditations and incantations, false religions that are man-driven and not God-driven. And we can see in this that that we try so many ways to get to God on our own. But let me tell you this, my friend. There is no way except through Jesus Christ. There is no other way for you to enter into a holy presence of God other than covered in the blood of Jesus. You might say that you don't believe in God. You might say that you're good enough and that you've not sinned too badly. But none of it is good enough. You can't pay enough tithe. You can't 
You can't buy enough stuff for people. You can't meet everyone's needs and get into heaven. It requires the blood-bought sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The third example, we see the choice of Aaron to represent Israel before God in his sanctuary. And the staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. Thus I will make to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against you. Acts 4.12 tells us that Jesus is the only way to God. And there is salvation, it says, sin. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We see it in... And Aaron was chosen as the one to represent the the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ is the better representation. He is the one who has stood in the gap that we would know who he is and that we would be able to enter into the presence of a holy God. Only Jesus can provide access to God. John 1.17 tells us, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came through Moses, one man, but but now the the opportunity, the mercy and grace and truth of of a holy God comes now through one man, Jesus Christ. Moses brought the law, but the grace of God and his truth was revealed through Jesus. The grace and truth was shown through Jesus. What an amazing picture of what what the gospel is. I want to close with this. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? He dies and his sisters Mary and Martha are upset because Jesus was late getting there and their their brother had died. Jesus shows up a while later and Mary's upset with him. Martha has some questions. and Jesus asked Martha if she believed. She said, yes, I believe in the final resurrection. This is what Jesus said to her after she made that statement. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. He asked her, Do you believe? And her response was, Yes, I do. He asked her, Do you believe I am who I say I am? And she says, Yes. She trusted him personally. She related to him She believed not with blind faith, but with with a faith that she knew would come to fruition. If you would just believe. It sounds really easy, doesn't it? Almost simple, like it's not enough, that it's, it's just too easy. And you know those things, those scams on TV and and you get in the mail of, of these things. If you just do this one thing, then this is going to happen. You know, you take this pill and you become skinny. Or you, you give $500 and God's going to give you 5000 back. You know, you have all these scans. Things that seem too easy are usually not real, aren't they? If it's too easy to be true, it's probably not true. And while this seems simple and easy... It's not quite that simple. You see, to trust someone, to have a relationship with someone can be the hardest thing you can do. Those of you who are married, you know that it's not always just a, a box of roses, is it? It's not always just easy to, uh, to, to be married and exist in a relationship and live with someone. You know, I, I got in trouble early on in our marriage because I... Uh, my mom did a lot of things for me. She she went above and beyond. She took care of me really well, and um, we won't go into all those things. But but I was used to having dessert for for every night. Okay, uh, homemade pies or cookies or cakes. We always had something. 
there was always a batch of icing because she used to make cakes. There's always a batch of icing in the fridge. So you put that on graham crackers. Ooh, that's my favorite thing. But you, you, you know, but my wife didn't grow up that way. You know, and so you get married and you have to learn to live with someone else. I had only ever lived with my mom and dad and, and my brother. That's all I had ever lived with. The same goes with friendship, isn't it? It's, it's, there's always a two-way street. It's always you're working to maintain the relationship, either with your spouse or with another friend or, or colleague or someone else in your life, and you're always working back and forth. And it takes a lot of work to maintain the relationship at times, doesn't it? But you see, Jesus is different. And human relationships are requirements that all must keep. You have to work at the relationship. It is you holding on to the other person's hand. It's active. You are required to hold on. You see, but with Jesus, all it requires is that you believe. He is the one that does the holding on. He is the one that that sustains and provides and meets the needs. All he's asking you is to give him everything. Not quite as simple, was is it? When I say he asks us to give him everything, that means we don't get to keep boxes that we try to manage. You see, when you believe, Jesus swoops in and covers you. He meets your needs and provides salvation. He comes in that moment when you trust him with your life, and when he comes, the relationship is maintained by him. But you must trust Him and believe in Him. And He does all the rest. My question to you this morning is, do you believe in Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? Do you trust Him as a Father? Do you know Him? We've already seen in the text that no one gets to the Father except by Jesus Christ. You must trust in Him. You must believe in Him. You must have a relationship with Him. Why does that happen? It's because He's a God who who exists in relationship. The the three, the, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, were in perfect relationship. Still are. He's a God of relationships. He he wants to be a part of your life. But do you know Him? This morning, if you want to come to believe, if you want to trust Him, if you're ready to give up everything, cry out to Jesus. Tell him that I can't do it, but I know you can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for loving us. We thank you for for sending your son to die on the cross, that we would have a relationship, the ability to enter into your presence. Father, we admit and we know that Your Son, Jesus, is the only way that we are able to come before you. None of us are good enough. We haven't haven't bought enough kind things or done enough good deeds that we would enter into your presence, Father, uh, because of our own accord. We know that it is only by the blood of Jesus that we are able to do that. But, Father, for the person who has not given up everything for you, Lord, we ask that you would, your Spirit would speak and would proclaim truth into their lives. Father, that you would lay a a heaviest burden that you can on them, Lord, that they would come to know you and that they would would trust you and that they would come to a realization of faith. Father, that they would cry out to you and say, I need you, Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would begin to change hearts. Lord, help us to take the message of the gospel to those around us and across the globe. Father, help us to to realize our position as missionaries and 
how we are called, how we are made as believers to, to, to go into the nations. Father, I pray that it would begin with me. Lord, I ask that you would be in this time of invitation, that your spirit would speak to us. And that glory and honor and praise would be, would be added to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would stand.